Welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Okay, y'all gotta do better than that. How many people is not from Atlanta? Just wave at me. Okay, so let's, let's first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, this session will talk about the future of sustainable business and it will specifically talk about the circular economy. So we hope that wherever you traveled in from, you had safe travels and we hope that this session and the information you'll get from our panelists is gonna be something that you can take uh, great value in and take back to the states and the places in which you serve. Um, before we start, we have a brief video. I'm Lisa Milagro, Resilience and Sustainability Manager for Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport. We're always passionately greening ATL. That's why we're here to show you what happens to the plastic bottles that you recycle here. As one of the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 resilient cities, we're committed to sustainability. That's why when we process your recyclables, it's important for us to take a circular economic approach. Plastic bottles are collected from Georgia Aquarium, Lead Platinum Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and the busiest airport on the planet, ATL. These bottles are collected and then transformed to reprieve performance fiber. This fiber is used to manufacture our ATL volunteer staff jackets. Help us by recycling our plastic bottles. Who knows what they'll be next? Well, it froze, but you guys, uh, <laughs> you get the gist. So at this time, I want to take this opportunity for Lisa, uh, for Scott, for um, Amy, and for Tim to give a brief introduction, and then we'll jump right into our conversation, and uh, we'll, we'll get you guys in and out of here. So we'll start off right here with my good friend, Scott. Thank you very much, Daniel. Good I'm to see you. really pleased to be here. I'm representing the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and some of you may know that they sort of coined the phrase uh, circular economy about 15 years ago. And over the last 10 years, the foundation has grown and we have now 480 corporate members. Each one that joins needs to make some kind of a commitment that their products and packaging will uh, form circularity uh, within a stated period of time. So regardless of the size of the corporation, all of those that join make these commitments and you'll see them published from time to time, but specifically in January because the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, reports every year in Davos at the World Economic Forum on progress during the year and on new places that are being uh, addressed. So uh, my position is as a director of the board and I'm pleased to be here with these people I know so well. <laughs> All right, I'm Tim Trefser. Um, I'm with the Georgia World Congress Center Authority, so you are in one of our properties. Welcome. Um, I oversee our environmental and social responsibility efforts for our campus, which not only includes this four million square foot convention center, but is also anchored by Centennial Olympic Park and Mercedes-Benz Stadium, along with the uh, Savannah Convention Center in Savannah, Georgia. Um, my role really focuses on three primary areas, one being um, our internal operations, being as efficient and um, seamless as possible. We're the largest LEED certified convention center in the world. Um, we've got a number of other great internal operations that um, really help elevate, elevate us to that effort. Um, I also work closely with our events, a lot of our mega events in particular that really come to Atlanta and want to leave a positive legacy within the community. And then thirdly, doing now a lot of community outreach and really in particular on the west side of Atlanta, trying to um, really bridge the gap with, that is Northside Drive and um, try to work with a number of local nonprofits and other organizations that are placing a lot of emphasis in that area. Thanks Thank for having us. Thank you so us. much. Appreciate it. Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Milagro, the Resilience and Sustainability Manager for Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International okay. Airport, the only part of the video you got a chance to see. Um, um, my responsibility is essentially to make sustainability sexy. That includes reducing um, our emissions, water, and energy by 20% by 2020, our waste by 90% by 2020, um, and taking pushing the envelope to make Hartsfield-Jackson uh, one of the greenest airports in the world. Um, in doing so, 
we work with our local institutions, our city partners to shape policies, programs, and initiatives that advance our program as a city and to reduce our impacting uh, footprint. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amy? Hi, I'm Amy Osaker. I'm the Executive Director of Envision Charlotte, and we are a nonprofit in Charlotte, North Carolina, that works with the city on large-scale sustainability project projects. Obviously, the one that we are most excited about to talk about today is Circular Charlotte. We're the first U.S. city to have a strategy for the transition to a circular economy that we launched at the beginning of 2018. Thank you so much. Well, let's just go right into it. We just had a pretty big event that many of you are all familiar with, which is the Super Bowl. And, um, you know, both of you, one being with the World Congress Center, the other with the airport, we saw a lot of opportunity. Can you explain what types of lessons you learned and what you implemented beforehand to make sure that event not only had an impact in the right way, but that also is measurable for those of us who are here from various industries. What can you share with us from the lessons you learned from the Super Bowl that recently was in Atlanta? Um, so what you didn't get to see in the video, but was what was really cool about um, the way we worked together for Super Bowl was for the first First of all, for the airport, we created the greenest Super Bowl in aviation history. And that included partnering with the Georgia Aquarium and uh, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium to ensure that the plastic bottles that were being recycled at the airport were not only collected, but we had um, 10,000 volunteer jackets. And uh, within that, the airport had about 1,000 volunteer jackets as well. And each one of those jackets were made in were made out of six bottles. So the bottles that we recycled, we worked with a strategic partner uh, in Raleigh, Unify or Reprieve Fiber, and that plastic we wore in a really wonderful way. But what was also measurable about Super Bowl was we were the first to have a compre we were the first city to have a comprehensive food recovery program. I'll go into more of those details later um, when we talk about the food recovery program at the airport. But collectively, just for the 10 days of activation, uh, we did about 24,000 pounds of recoverable edible food. We uh, created roughly 20,000 meals for the deserving constituency of the city with a concentration on veterans, seniors, and children. And we reduced our emissions uh, impact just from the food recovery program by roughly 19,000 pounds of CO2. So uh, it's possible, but it requires partnerships, um, and a commitment to the purpose. We were very clear that we wanted to set the bar high, uh, not just for the airport, but the city, and there's a little bit of competition in that too, so we would like to see how Miami does with capturing the level of metrics that we have been able to do um, this year, but it's, it's a, it is an example of how when you work together with a clear intent, Sustainability can hit all of the high marks. The people, the planet, and the profits are absolutely possible. And that impact is something that we were able to do together. So, yeah. Thank you. Tim. Yeah, um, you know, it's really refreshing to have a, an organization like the NFL, um, surprisingly, has a sustainability director on staff and has been on staff for over 25 years. And so when they come to facilities like ours, they're the ones that are really pushing us as a venue to um, do more. And fortunately for Super Bowl, since they've had such a great success in the past, they were able to replicate a lot of those efforts here in Atlanta, everything from food recovery, material recovery, working closely with a lot of the nonprofit organizations to capture not only uh, food waste, but we're also talking like the, the furniture that they bring in, the carpet, the building and construction materials that can all be reused. So we've fortunately in Atlanta got a lot of great nonprofits that were able to benefit from a lot of those efforts. And then speaking to the social piece, one of the really unique pillars of Super Bowl that they've been doing for the last 20 years is called Super Kids Super Sharing. 
and it's a one-day event where they bring in students from all across Metro Atlanta, and in this case, there were even students coming in from Savannah that uh, brought in donated books, sporting equipment, um, school supplies, and all of that material was then uh, donated to schools in the area in need, and in just one day alone for Atlanta, over 40,000 items were collected and distributed um, throughout the area. So there's a lot of great efforts going on behind some of these mega events. We're now planning for the final four, which will be here in April, and um, already had a, a sustainability committee meeting today, and how, how that will look um, in April for our campus is really exciting. So I do want to come back to you because I know you mentioned final four. I know that uh, the city of Atlanta, we have Green Build coming up, which is one of the largest gatherings with the builders, the architects, the designers, a lot of great things happening. But from your standpoint, Amy, and the stance that you guys have taken, I guess from the whole project in Charlotte and you all taking the lead, what have you learned that can be replicated in cities that either are working towards that goal or that aren't there yet? Well, what we did is we hired a firm out of uh, Amsterdam called Metabolic to analyze our waste stream. So the first thing that we did, and I would say you'd want to do this in any project, is collect the data. So we looked at our waste stream and we looked at the opportunities that we had in our waste stream and we identified four main areas and then we are also building an innovation center which we're calling the innovation barn because it used to be an old horse barn. See how we're bringing things right back around? <laughs> um, but the four business cases that we're looking at doing are the four big areas in our waste which is plastics. Um, and we have Sealed Air which is headquartered in North Carolina and they do the air pillows and the bubble wrap. And the interesting thing about that is right now you can't put that in curbside recycling because it mucks up the MRF. So, but they want it back to reincorporate it into their products. So we're trying to figure out logistically how do you get that type of material back. We also have Coca-Cola Consolidated, the largest bottler in the U.S., headquartered in Charlotte. And they want, as you know here in Atlanta, they want their bottles back. I think their goal is one-to-one -one bottles back for every one they put out. And in Charlotte alone, they have 1.2 million bottles that leave their, their floor every week. So by 2030, they want 1.2 million bottles back. So we're working up bottles and cans and plastics. Uh, so plastics is one. Uh, concrete is another one. So we're looking at concrete recycling. We're doing a um, business plan around that right now that the city might actually own that business model. Um, there is organics. Foods, so we are doing a big pilot around soldier flies and um, using soldier flies to break down the organics, which create larvae, which is great feed for stock. But also, we'll be having in our barn an aquaponic garden where the larvae will go feed the fish, the fish will grow the or feed the plants, the plants will take care of the water, and the water goes back to the fish. Um, so, we're working on a big organics program, and then the last one is. Don't you love it when you have like the three and then there's the fourth one that is on the tip of my tongue? I'll remember it by the end. Um, so I would say for other people, it's starting with what you have and looking at the data so that you can set those baselines, then implement the programs, and then measure your results over time, which sounds like Atlanta yeah. is doing a fantastic job. And then also as a follow-up to you, Amy, what were, because you make it sound really simple. Right? And, and I, I, I wish it was that easy to work in cities to build these kind of programs, but can you explain to us really quickly, um, building that kind of coalition in Charlotte, how, like, what were some of the barriers you all may have faced, and then what were some of the things, like, for instance, was the business community and, and, and the state legislature or the, or the city council, was everybody just excited about getting involved and, and working on it, or, or did it take some pushing and some shelving a little bit to try and get everybody on board? Well, it is North Carolina, so we don't do a lot with Raleigh. Um, but Charlotte is pretty progressive. And so the way we started is we took a group of city leaders to Amsterdam and we actually looked at what they were doing there in the circular economy. And so we had an elected official, we had city, the city managers, assistant city managers. And it was very interesting when you have a consultant talking about the fact that you can take stuff out of the landfill and create jobs for a city, suddenly they're like, oh, we want to do that. So we brought the concept back, we took it to city council. City council, of course, loved it because you're taking things out of landfill, reducing CO2, and creating jobs in, and innovation. And we are lucky to have a city manager that wants to do something for the first time. There are lots of cities who want to be number one at being number two, or be number one at being number two. They don't want to be the first to do something. Our city wanted to be the first. So 
that was the positive. The hurdles are internally in the city, there are people who are not as innovative and want to do things the same old way. And so even building this barn right now has been very challenging, getting around codes, you know, trying to reuse things that aren't code or you have to put new in or you have to, you know, just little tiny things and getting people to understand and try to be more innovative within the city itself has been challenging. One of the other assets, there are lots of companies in Charlotte who are part of Ellen MacArthur and, and Charlotte joined Ellen MacArthur, so there are some really good resources that we've been able to get the private sector like Coca-Cola Consolidated, Sealed Air, to put pressure on the city to do these kinds of initiatives. So it's it's been easy because of the leadership, but hard because of internal of course, yeah. uh, tension. And, yeah. and you, you mentioned Ellen MacArthur and Scott, you know, we've known each other for a long time and over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a huge transition in cities and the leadership they're taking. Can you walk us through what Ellen MacArthur has done as far as the, the, the whole circular economy is concerned and what does that mean to you? Because for many people here, some of us came because we were interested and others came because they're in that space where they wanna know what that looks like in their own cities. Can you let us know what that looks like to you and how the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has continued to contribute to this conversation? Well, thank you, Daniel. That would really be hard to summarize in a short period of time because we're working on everything from paper and cars to tractors and, uh, the, uh, all of the other materials that you see every day and particularly packaging and particularly within the packaging sphere of plastics. I think all three of my fellow panelists and myself have mentioned organics here today. And you know, you wouldn't have gone to a conference like this four or five years ago and talked about composting unless you went to the compost council because it just really wasn't a sexy thing to bring the uh, organics together. But that is the epitome of what the circular economy is all about. And the reason why is because of the helping hand from nature. Basically, what we're doing is taking waste foodstuffs and turning them back into foodstuffs. And um, we're working now in several large cities in the United States. Uh, I just came from nine years in New York, where we started a program up there now that has already expanded to 350,000 residential uh, locations and uh, will eventually go to over a million residences in the city of New York. And using that compost uh, back in the highways and byways around the city has saved the city on the order of somewhere around $300 million. So you really make an impact with this circularity in the question of things like plastics, we all know that if you tear open a bag of chips or a wrapper or something like that, the chances because of its weight and because of the identity it has with three or four different types of plastics together, the chances of it being recycled are probably pretty nil. So the way we view circularity in that area is to try to make these materials so that they can go back into the organic systems and that they will compost or biodegrade into something that's worthwhile for the, the, the plant life. On the recycling side, uh, we also know that all of the materials that are made from plastic are made for the consumer, for consumption. But consumption seems to stop at that bridge you get to where uh, you discard it. Basically, what the Ellen MacArthur Foundation asks the companies that manufacture these materials to do is to pledge that they will take responsibility for anything they make from life to death or from life to recycling. And the, and the, the major theme is to make that bottle back into a bottle again to make that textile back into a textile again, or to make that paper back into a paper again. And so that's, that is the concentration, and it's that concentration that really has attracted large corporations who really do want to take on these responsibilities, but in doing so, you have to change the way you design things, and you often change the value of the manufacturing assets you have in your factories because they have to perform differently than they have before, and that becomes an expensive operation. So a lot of this is done collectively and a lot of it's done with corporations working together, but the movement is really, really strong. So thank you, Daniel. I'd no like problem. to piggyback off of what Scott, was, Scott and Amy were saying. 
Um, let's put some things in context here. You know, Hartsville-Jackson is the busiest airport on the planet. We do about, a, we're on par to do a roughly 110 million passengers this year. That's about 285,000 passengers a day. And that's just a basic day. That's not including the Masters, the Super Bowl, and NCAA. Um, and so when you look at putting programs or policies or initiatives together, uh, it's definitely a concerted effort. We did definitely start with our waste characterization audit. Once you understand what you have um, from a waste perspective or any of your other fixed or non-fixed assets, uh, you understand where you can put it. And when we did our waste characterization audit, it was back when we were only doing 94 million passengers a year. But needless to say, we identified where our contaminants were, what our assets in the stream were, and we decided to, um, as the first aviation entity, a part of the Ellen MacArthur uh, Circular Plastics Report, um, embrace of where the industry was going. And as a result, now we are in early design for a project called Green Acres ATL Energy Park. It's a full stream recycling facility that's designed to process the roughly 35 to 40,000 tons of commodities that we generate. It all starts with how we refer to waste versus commodities, okay? Waste is something that has no other use, can go nowhere else, and has met the end of its life. Commodities, that is what the majority of our streams are made up of. On average, we're looking at 32% organics, 30 percent, 27 to 30 percent in plastics, and then you've got your polystyrene number six or your number fives. If you have a policy that can remove those things, that is going to help clean up your stream even further so that you can really highlight the commodities in your stream. Green Acres ATL Energy Park is a project that we're building on the airport's campus. It's um, right across from our fifth runway, and it we don't have a whole lot of composting options in, or, or organics diversion options in this city. So by being able to create that opportunity, we can A, ensure if with our institutional partners that we're going to be able to take a responsible approach to processing our, our plastics, but we are also going to be able to uh, provide a local opportunity for processing our organic organics, um, either that being waste to energy or a composting element. And Green Acres also has a controlled environmental agricultural aspect associated with it as well. People are going to say, oh, you have an AD system and you're putting out CO2. No correction. We're capturing that CO2, channeling it back into our greenhouses with the aquaponics, and we're taking even a circular approach to the, the carbon dioxide that would be produced from the anaerobic digestion system. So for every single thing that we do, all of us, no metrics, no story. So Tim, and thank you for that. And, and Tim, I think it, it's really important for us to know, especially with the two of you, Lise and yourself, you deal with multiple, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of visitors every year, millions, right? So what, what roles can consumers play? and continuing to drive that. You know, obviously investing into or supporting companies that have sustainable products is important, but you know, it's it's easy for us to look at the industry and be in the positions we're in, but for those of uh, individuals that may not be in the room that we all may collectively reach, what are some better ways that consumers can play a more active role in partnering with socially responsible organizations to drive this conversation and create the kind of economy that we all want to see? Um, yeah, so we actually had three 3.77 million people visit our campus last year, not hundreds of millions, but um, we, you know, we are kind of at the behest of the events that we host, and um, really each event is unique and different, and um, they ultimately get the say of what materials they're using, and in some cases, how they're discarded. So I really think that, especially in the case of sporting events, but even in the case of trade shows and conventions, as attendees, we need to be enforcing the meeting planners and event planners to think differently about how they go about hosting an event. And um, it's happening. It's happening in some industries quicker than it is in others. But, um, you know, for instance, the convention industry traditionally would use um, foam core boards for signage throughout the venue. And um, today, if you look at any of the signage here for Smart City Expo, 
it's all corrugated board, and um, that's 100% recyclable. So that's just one example, but um, you know, we as attendees have to ask the questions. When you get a follow-up survey, put it in the follow-up survey, ask for metrics, ask for data. You want to know, the more you ask, the more they'll, they'll change. And, and I guess, because we're, we're, we're getting to that point, we've got to get ready to close up pretty soon, but for Amy and for Scott, you know, when we think of these partnerships, and more so to what you said, Amy, about what you guys are doing in Charlotte, um, I would not say that, that the, the uh, government participation has to, it has to be government-led, right? But in many senses, some people may argue, is it mandatory, how much of that responsibility or what role it plays? When you look at the organization you have, and even with, with you, Scott, with Ellen MacArthur Foundation, what, what role and, and how involved does government need to be, especially given the time of urgency that we're in? Uh, what would you all say that that type of involvement should look like? Well, government will really push things along. There's no question about that. I think, though, if you take plastics in general, uh, if you get a commitment from manufacturers that they will use a certain level of recycled plastics, they're creating a secondary market that makes those sec those, the collection of those plastics suddenly become uh, a profitable option. So you can depend on industry to take that step. Nevertheless, in uh, Europe and in the UK, uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, won approval with a lot of the governmental agencies so that in Scotland you have a deposit law that brings the bottles back. Uh, in the UK you have a high uh, level of recycled content regulation. And in places like France, they just passed a ban against uh, plastics altogether. These kinds of uh, movements make things happen faster, and that speed uh, leads to a lot of research that, that changes the ball game. Here in the United States, though, we've also had a growth, a rapid growth of companies that are recycling materials. Uh, as Lisa said about the jackets, there's a lot of opportunity to turn bottles into fibers. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, uh, initiatives that are being taken up by the manufacturers themselves to do a, a lot more collection. So it's really a, a mixture, and I think you'll begin to see that politics will step in uh, when the constituency requires them to. So if they get concerned about bottles in the ocean or bottles in the streams, uh, they'll make a move to ask for a better collection system. That's a great answer. Amy? Yeah, and Charlotte, since the city picks up the trash, I mean, they have huge influence on where it goes, how it's being uh, distributed or reused or upcycled. Um, so I think you have to have the government involved. In Charlotte, we are a non-home rule state, meaning anything, any policy that Charlotte passes, Raleigh can override. So if we ban plastic bags, they would tell us that we'd have to use four plastic bags in every shopping trip. So we have to do the carrot versus the stick. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is figure out ways that the city can manage waste better, so that's one of that. But the other is connecting different companies together. So for example, Apple is looking at doing zero waste in some of their data centers. One of their data centers is very near Charlotte. They were looking at, they did a waste audit. They have tons of flimsy plastic. So they're looking at their town saying, what can we do with this flimsy plastic? Well, sealed air right down the road wants it back. So there's a way to make connections to kind of skip the city, to connect these two, and you need people like, us who can make that, hey, you should be talking to you. And it's a good thing that what Ellen, MacArthur's, Ellen MacArthur is doing as well. But I think the more people start talking about opportunities with how to get waste to its next commodity to it, I'm going to have to start using that, right? Commodity right. to, it's also like a aspirational recyclers who you think you can recycle this and you can't. But anyway, so how we can also make those connections for different companies, different individuals on where things can go in its most productive way. Okay, so what we're going to do, because we're, we're getting towards that time, I want each of you to give us somewhat of a call to action, but I also want you to think about, it's easy, especially for someone like myself who's been in Atlanta, and we have great public and private partnerships. We have a willingness from local government, from organizations, from donors and family offices. But, you know, when you look at Georgia, we have 159 counties in the state of Georgia, right? So how do we encourage these same practices or 
offer the same types of opportunities in areas that may be rural to the cities and, and that we are serving in. Because what works in Charlotte, there may be another county in, in uh, North Carolina that doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the partnerships. What would you say to those organizations? And what, what we'll do by closing out is just think about how we can make this type of leadership transformative and what you would like to share with the audience um, before we leave. So we'll start with Amy and we'll, we'll end with Scott. Nothing like an easy question at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, well, what we're trying to do is do some innovation around creating jobs using materials going to the waste stream. So I think that if we can start some incubating some jobs and showing that there's an opportunity for jobs and revenue, that applies to every city, big and small. So I think what we're hoping to do is if we can you know, perfect examples, Rothy's, the, the shoe company. If we can come up with companies like that, you can easily take those to the rural parts of North Carolina and start new little startup jobs that can grow quite large. So I think that's, that, that transcends any size city. Thank you. Um, policies stimulate innovation. My Airports are a microcosm of the cities that they reside in. So through the implementation of programs that make sense, not just so that you can say you're doing something, but some uh, programs that really have impact, like our Food Heroes program, for instance. Um, we kicked that off in uh, J July 16th of 2018. Uh, we're the first entity in the world to use blockchain technology to track the food that we collect every evening from our concessionaires uh, to the community where the food is deposited, Covenant House, Phoenix House and several other organizations in the city, uh, we have real-time reporting. Um, we are feeding our constituency, we're diverting food from the landfill, we're able to report the metrics. These are policies or, or actions that can resonate with communities as a whole. Every community has a restaurant. Many communities have hotels. If we can make this work at the airport, in the last year, we have diverted over 215,000 pounds of recoverable edible food. We've created over 200,000 meals for the deserving constituents of the city. And that doesn't include the Super Bowl numbers. We've reduced our emissions associated with uh, this landfill diversion uh, by about 185,000 pounds. These are real metrics. These are programs that will allow us to create a lesion of food heroes. These are the types of programs that can resonate with all communities. Um, our sustainable food court initiative. The airport was, we banned styrofoam. Oh no, we banned styrofoam. But, you know, the reality is, is that it allowed us to require our over 100 restaurants to uh, use biodegradable product institute or Cedar Grove accepted materials. So everything's compostable. Are we composting yet? No, behavior change is a part of the process and introducing things in steps and tiers, educating your consumers. We've got over 400 screens in the, in the airport where we create public service announcements. We have to educate people on what we're doing, the signage we have on our recycling containers, our commitment. We have to reintroduce that on a regular basis. Make it sexy. Sustainability is fun. Okay, it's not just for Birkenstocks and granola bars anymore. Let's disband the myth and let's get on board. That's why we're having this conversation now. This is where we're headed. And operationally, it makes sense. It saves money and this is what cities are moving towards. The geotagging, I didn't get into that, but it ensures that the food um, maintains uh, temperatures so that we reduce our spoilage. These are the types of programs that move cities ahead and we can do do this in a, in a way to practice collective cooperative economics. Thank That's you. a no-brainer. Thank you so much. Tim. Yeah, I think Lisa touched on it. You know, it's about eliminating waste, and waste also comes in the form of costs. And, um, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's about reframing the story. Um, if venues like ours can implement these initiatives that are eliminating waste and also generating revenue in a lot of cases and generating more business, we have to tell that story because a lot of folks, especially in um, some rural counties, believe that green costs green and in a lot of cases it saves green, makes green, and so we just got to disband that belief and um, tell the story differently. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you so much, Tim. Scott? So 
So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is now extended to 120 countries. We've written programs for India and China and for a lot of states in the United States as well as cities and municipalities and we're very active in Europe. Basically, we have people like this that have grasped the meaning of the circular economy and are really starting to make these changes happen. And the, me the simple message is this. If you're manufacturing a product or a package that can't be made back into the same product and package and collected economically for that purpose, we'll be coming to see you. Thank you all so much. This concludes the future of the sustainable business. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of Smart Cities. We appreciate it.